Minerals have a specific definition in geology. For something to qualify as a mineral, it has to meet five key parameters, as we'll go over later using the helpful acronym DISCO. But before we go into what makes a mineral, I'd like to show you an analogy that I like to use to explain what makes a mineral versus a rock. So my analogy is based on your knowledge of letters and words. You've mastered letters and, letters and words since probably preschool, so it should be a pretty easy analogy to take on. So if you think of a word, words are always made up of letters. Sometimes a word can be a single letter, like I or A. Sometimes you will see a word made up of many letters, but anytime you hear of a specific word, it always has the same components. So if you think of the word what, what is always spelled, when spelled properly, W-H-A-T. With a mineral, anytime you have a single mineral, such as uh, salt or hematite, it is always going to be made up of the same exact elements. It has a definite chemical composition. Sometimes a mineral can be made up of just one element, just like a word can be made up of just one letter. Minerals are different from rocks in that rocks would be more like a sentence. So a sentence can still be a single word or a single letter, such as if someone were to say, you know, who, who gives this bride? You can say, I. I give this bride. And it would just be a single letter, but it could stand on its own as a sentence or as a declaration. So a rock can be just one mineral, just one element. An example of that would be sulfur. Sulfur is made up of the element sulfur, but it counts as a mineral. All minerals are rocks. Not all rocks are single minerals. So a rock can be made up of a lot of minerals or just one. So this one here is just sulfur, just the element sulfur. So this mineral, this rock, rocks are, um, all minerals are rocks. So this one's just made up of one. Something else, however, let's take, ooh, let's take this one here, pyrite, also known as fool's gold. This one is made up of sulfur and iron, but all pyrite is going to have the definite chemical composition of being iron and sulfur. You might have different sizes of it, different sizes of crystals, perhaps different shininess from one specimen to the next, but it's all going to have the same definite components, just like a single word is going to be always made up of the same letters. So now we're past that analogy. Don't know if it helped, but I enjoy it. Now we're past that analogy. We'll get to the definition of a mineral. We're going to use the acronym DISCO. It's a fun acronym, hopefully easy to remember. Not all of the letters stand for a single word, so a couple of them are short phrases here. So with DISCO, the D stands for definite chemical composition. That's something I already mentioned. So the mineral sulfur is always going to be just S. Mineral pyrite is always going to be sulfur and iron. Looking at something like salt, this is the same as table salt. Hmm, salty. This is always going to be sodium and chloride. Always, always. Sometimes you might have a slight change in color because it might have some um, pigments trapped in it or it can have some um, impurities as we call it that can slightly change the color of it. An example of salt that has a slightly different color, grab it, is this here. This is a specimen from Cyril's Valley. There is a brine pool and this salt evaporates out of the or precipitates out of the water very very salty brine pools water evaporates the salt gets left behind and you get these crystals of salt now I could lick it this has been sitting out on the counter I'm not going to lick it but if I did it would just be salty it tastes just like salt but it looks different because it has some impurities in it however it still has that chemical composition that definite chemical composition of sodium and chloride the next letter is I stands for inorganic. Although we can use organic in a lot of different realms, like in Whole Foods, it might mean that there's no pesticides added or it's grown without any special hormones or anything added in. When you get into the sciences, organic has a different definition. 
Depending on which subject you're in, organic can mean that it has carbon and carbon bonds or carbon and hydrogen bonds, or that would be more of the chemistry or geochemistry definition of organic. When you're talking organic in terms of uh, geology, rocks, minerals, organic means that it doesn't, uh, or organic means relating to something alive. So something that's inorganic doesn't come from a living organism. So you sweat all the time. You're constantly sweating and salt is coming out in your skin. That little bits of salt on your skin, it comes from a living person. So that salt on your skin is not a mineral because it comes from a living being. However, this salt here came out of salty water, like the ocean or salt lake. So did this. This formed outside of life. It doesn't have to do with a living organism creating it. It doesn't contain any living organisms or pieces of living organisms. The minerals themselves are not alive, have not been alive. So another example would be something like calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is a key component in the shells of uh, sea creatures. So their shells, although it's made up of the same thing that a chunk of calcium carbonate chalk would be made up of, if it's organic or part of the living organism, it doesn't count as a mineral. However, if calcium carbonate precipitates out of water on its own, an example would be like um, travertine uh, shelves near hot springs, or perhaps the stalactites and stalagmites you will get in caves, those are calcium carbonate that is coming out of water naturally on its own. As the water evaporates, that rock forms, that mineral forms, so that is inorganic. It is a mineral. So it has to be inorganic. The next one, S, is solid. You cannot have a liquid mineral. So this brings us to a kind of complicated example. Ice can be made by a person. Ice can be made naturally, like snow, like uh, just freezing water on a winter day. Water has a definite chemical composition that meets our first one. Water can exist outside of being um, excreted or relating to a living organism, so water is inorganic. And water is usually, when we interact with it, liquid, but it can form solids naturally. So if ice has frozen in a natural environment on its own, it can count as a mineral. If you put water in your freezer and you let it freeze and get ice, that would not be a mineral because then it would be man-made. So that goes down to our O again of occurring naturally. But anytime something is a liquid, it's not a mineral, as soon as it precipitates or solidifies, it becomes a solid and minerals are solids. So this here, it's a solid, it's a mineral. If I were to throw this into a volcano and let it melt, it would still be iron and sulfur, but if it's no longer solid, it is no longer a mineral. Now we're going on to C, crystal structure. Because all of these solids that are minerals have a definite chemical composition, and because chemicals bond together in predictable patterns based off of their electron affinities, you get these definite known crystal compositions in every mineral. Every single mineral has its own unique crystal structure. You can't always see the crystal structure with your naked eye. So if you look at this pyrite, you can see those crystals. You can tell there are crystals there. You look at this chunk of salt here. It is one large crystal. It is clearly a crystal. And if you were to look at its atomic structure, it has this cubic nature, predictable cubic nature that is inherent to salt. If you were to take table salt at home and put it underneath a microscope, or maybe zoom way in on it on a, like a high-powered camera, you would see it's a bunch of little cubes. The crystal structure can also be seen here in the lake specimen. See all the little squares of salt in there. So a definite chemical composition and solid leads to a known crystal structure. Here we have an example of crystals that you can see with the naked eye. And this one here, you can't see it, but if you were to zoom in with some super high powered microscope or an electron microscope where you can see the atomic structure, you would see every single point on this mineral has a repeating predictable crystal structure. 
So this next mineral I'm going to show you, you all have used, you've all used it in early childhood because it is graphite. Graphite comes from the Greek word to write, graph, like when you're graphing something or a biography or something, it's the same word. So the reason it has that name is because this mineral is what is used in the lead of pencils. It's not actually lead. You would get lead poisoning if that was the case. But this is in pencils, and you can use it to write on a piece of paper. See, I just smudged it. There you go. So the reason it's doing that is because layers of its crystal structure are coming off onto the paper. This is all carbon, and the bonding is very, very weak. It has these little hexagons side to side, but they're in thin layers that can come off and flake off very easily. So although they're all bonded side to side pretty well, if you hold it just right, you can peel off these layers of carbon and they'll get stuck to your paper. If you were to have a pencil that was made well, you have all the layers oriented to the bottom of your pencil, but if you've ever had one of those really janky pencils that kind of scratches along your paper and doesn't really leave marks, and you're like, what the heck is wrong with this? It's because it was made with the mineral oriented in the wrong direction and it's not able to transfer the carbon to your paper. But this is a, a atomic structure of graphite. It's one that you've all handled before. This brings me to another key point. This is all carbon. Diamonds are all carbon. These aren't real diamonds, but diamonds are also all carbon. This looks gross and is filthy, but a diamond, even though it's all carbon, looks completely different. Although it has the same definite chemical composition, is also inorganic, and is also a solid, the crystal structure is different. In a diamond, all of the carbons are much more tightly packed, and they share more bonds with one another. So it's strong all around. If you were to rub a diamond on a piece of paper, you're not going to get a little line of glitter left behind. Instead, it will tear your paper because it's so strong. So crystal structure and definite chemical composition will tell you what mineral it is. If you had an electron microscope and you can see it's made up of carbon and they're all attached in this way, it is this element. So the example of graphite and diamonds, even though they're both made of the, uh, the black balls here represent carbon. Even though they're all made up of carbon, the difference in the structure will determine the outward appearance and the crystal shape of the resulting mineral. This is called a polymorph. If you're in the lecture, the word polymorphs will show up. You don't really need to know it for the lab. So now we're going on to occurs naturally. In order for something to be officially a mineral, it has to occur naturally. So something like calcite, it is calcium and carbonate. It is always calcium and carbonate. And this here occurred naturally. It has this really cool, flattened, smeared, rectangular structure. You can see that in the crystal structure as well, it's a smeared rectangle shape. And calcium carbonate is found all over the place. If you drink mineral water, Pellegrino or Perrier, you're drinking calcium carbonate. But what you're drinking, even though it's called mineral water, you're not drinking solid pieces. In order for that composition to count as a mineral, it has to be solid. So you're drinking it in the liquid form, it's ionized. But when it dries, if you were to leave your Perrier out in the sun and all the water evaporates and the calcium carbonate gets left behind, then you would get little tiny chunks of calcium carbonate. But it has to occur naturally. So in your example of leaving out a little tray of Perrier in the sun, it's kind of man-made. It's the same as putting water into your freezer. It wouldn't count as a mineral. But let's say you have mineral hot springs out in nature, and that water reaches the surface, the water evaporates, and a whole bunch of little crystals get left behind. Those would be minerals. So to be a mineral, Definite chemical composition, inorganic, solid, crystal structure, and occurs naturally.